Hello, how's that working? Everyone can hear me all right? Great. All right, well, uh, thanks for coming, everyone. Um, today I'm here, gonna hear, here to talk to you about uh, Rocket Netties and some of the things that have been happening recently with, in the container runtime uh, area and particularly how they uh, integrate with Kubernetes. Uh, I'm Jonathan Bull, I work at CoreOS. Uh, I've been there for a couple of years working on, for the last year or so, working mostly on container-related container technologies. So first, just a kind of quick introduction to Rocket. So Rocket is a, a command line tool for running app containers on Linux. Um, and we have sort of three guiding focuses in our development of Rocket and its architecture and design. Um, and those sort of three, three pillars are uh, first security, um, being as secure as, as possible, um, and then second composability, so being able to integrate well with other systems. Um, and then finally, you know, we're, we're big fans of sort of open standards and being compatible with as many different systems as possible. And so that's uh, quite important in, in Rocket development. Um, just a very quick kind of history overview. Rocket was first announced in December of 2014. At the time, it was very much a prototype um, and very much sort of intended to drive this conversation in the ecosystem around things that we didn't really feel were necessarily being taken too seriously um, in the container, in container, at the container technology at the time. Um, so things like security, as I mentioned, and, and standards. Um, and then also just because we, you know, we believe strongly in open source at CoreOS. This is an open source conference, um, and you know, we think that part of open, a healthier ecosystem and open source is competition. So at the time, you know, there was one sort of dominant uh, container tool being used. We didn't want that to be, you know, the only tool that people could use. Um, we think, you know, as we've seen over the last year or so, that this competition's driven a lot of innovation and um, cool features uh, in the ecosystem. Um, a few months ago, in, in February, we announced that Rocket as being sort of 1.0, which meant, um, you know, it had already been used in production for some time, but that, that's sort of the point at which we felt comfortable to say, okay, we're gonna provide some guarantees around sort of the on-disk format, um, API, and things like that. And then fast forwarding a few months, we've um, kept up a very regular release cadence. Um, and so the most recent release was a few days ago, 1.5.1. Um, and <clears throat> now um, at this release, you know, we see Rocket packaged across a bunch of diff different distributions. So it's available um, much more widely than just in, in CoreOS itself. So I mentioned that we focus on these three areas. I'm gonna talk a little bit about each of them in turn. Um, so the first is security. So this sort of guides us in, in two main ways. Um, the first is that when we're developing the UX of Rocket, uh, you know, we, we want it to be secure by default. So we do things like verifying image signatures and verifying image integrity by default. Um, and that even extends, when I say image integrity, that actually extends to, for example, the uh, integrity of the image on disk. So you know, by default, Rocket will actually verify uh, when you run a, a container that the images on disk are, you know, still match the expected um, hashes of all the files there. Um, obviously, that can be quite intensive, so we provide options to, you know, to optimize by skipping these sorts of things, but we want that to be, um, you know, the default behavior is for, for things to be as, as sort of verified and checked as possible. Um, and then the second, second uh, aspect of, that really influences uh, security, we think, is, is sort of the architecture. So uh, and with most CoreOS projects, we try to follow kind of the Unix philosophy of having a very well-defined uh, scope for tools. So they should do one thing and do, one, and do, do it well. And then even within tools, so within a tool like Rocket, uh, each of the different sort of sub-functionalities should be quite well scoped in itself. And so, for example, um, different operations that a container runtime needs to do, like downloading images over the internet, should be able to done uh, with a completely different set of privileges to uh, other, you know, uh, other operations like creating and running a container, which at the current time, you know, requires root in most sort of situations on Linux. And so uh, the other aspect there is that uh, the Rocket process model, which I'll talk about in a minute, means that uh, Rocket you know, instances are fully self-contained. There's no uh, long-running component that you know, would be another potential uh, 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 exploit route. Or, you know. So we really try to minimize the, um, minimize the surface area for attacks by making Rocket containers um, self-contained processes. And then you know, under the hood, what that actually means is that we you know, try to take advantage of as many technologies as we can. Um, as I said, Rocket's targeted mostly at Linux, so uh, you know, classic Linux containers, technologies like cgroups and namespaces, um, but then also some more modern technologies like uh, user namespaces to make sure that you separate the context of uh, users running in the host from users on the, uh, within the containers. Um, we integrate with things like SE Linux, um, and we're working on support for AppArmor to isolate individual pods on the system from each other. Um, 
we have support in Rocket for using uh, actual hardware virtualization using the KVM backend, which I'll talk about in a minute, which gets you, you know, additional guarantees that the, the processor provides for isolation between processors. Uh, and then we also added support a few months ago to Rocket for uh, using the TPM. That's this trusted uh, platform module on, on many modern uh, Intel motherboards uh, to provide this sort of tamper-proof audit log that's guaranteed uh, at the, by the hardware itself uh, of you know, what's running on the system, so every container that's running on the system. And then things we're sort of working on, um, since we're always trying to, to improve security in Rocket, uh, we're working on you know, splitting apart more fine-grained uh, capabilities among the different processes in a Rocket pod. Uh, that's Linux capabilities I'm, I'm referring to here. And then you know, setting some tighter defaults around other features that the Linux kernel provides, like uh, SecComp or uh, no new privileges, which means preventing, privileges, uh, preventing processes from ever being able to gain new privileges. Um, we're working on better SE Linux integration, since at the moment it only works on a couple of platforms, and that needs to be done on a very, uh, what is it, platform in uh, distribution. It's quite distribution specific. Um, and then we're working on uh, support for the new secret hierarchy that's being, uh, that's being, that's going to, the unified hierarchy in, 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 the, in, the, in the Linux kernel um, that's, that's sort of being worked on pretty actively at the moment. And for cgroup namespaces, which allow us to provide more isolation and cgroup control within the pods. And then finally, there's some work uh, to, to allow you to create containers entirely unprivileged, which means you know, that's kind of the holy grail where we can do all rocket operations as, as a non-root user on the system. And then the second sort of pillar of, of rocket development is around composability. So by composability, there's sort of two aspects to this. Um, what I kind of call external composability, which is you know, integrating rocket with other systems, like with init systems, with orchestration systems, which I'll talk about more in a second. And then internal composability, which means that uh, even you know, within Rocket, we want, uh, we want different, different modules to be sort of swappable. Um, so things like the network plugin system. Um, and the key thing here is the execution, uh, the execution engine, which is uh, the Rocket sort of staged architecture. Uh, but first, looking at external composability. So as I mentioned, um, in Rocket, you know, the, 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 Unix, the Unix process model is very fundamental. So when you run a Rocket command, that is the whole container. And the really important thing there is that any context you apply, so cgroups, constraints, uh, any namespaces you start the Rocket container in, are applied to the whole pod of all the po applications running in the container. So to give you a quick idea of what that looks like, you know, here we have sort of our invoking process, which could be a shell, could be your you know, init system like systemd, could be the, the kubelet and Kubernetes. And that, that's what's responsible for invoking Rocket in what we call stage zero, which is sort of the, basically the API or the CLI uh, to Rocket. And then Rocket has another two stages, stage one and stage two, where the actual uh, execution happens, the actual execution of the apps in the pod. So stage one provides this abstraction of, of the pod, and this is where sort of most of the containment happens. So you know, classically, it will set up um, C groups and namespaces and things like that. And then within that context, your actual applications, you know, the thing as a developer, you develop and you bundle up your container image and you, you actually care about running, they run within that context. So the idea to, to separating these stages is to, firstly, so with stage zero, you can provide a consistent experience to the user or to the, you know, the system that you're integrating with. But then by abstracting stage one out, we can swap in uh, different stage ones and get different sort of uh, isolation primitives. <coughs> But by having a consistent expectation for stage two for what the apps uh, are going to be running in, then you know, you're, you know that your apps are going to work um, no matter what stage one is being used. So um, as I said, so the rocket, sort of RKT, the command line, that's the API. And that's the, that's the UX. And that's sort of the, you know, what we guarantee that you can integrate with and get a predictable experience. And we, we, you know, we sort of consider that the technology inside, the actual containment, is more of sort of an implementation detail. You know, as a user or as a systems, uh, as an integrator, when you're integrating with, with Kubernetes or something, you shouldn't care that much about all the individual, the Im implementation details of the container. Uh, you just want to know that it's, you know, it's going to be contained. You're going to have certain guarantees. Uh, by default, you know, in Rocket, we, we ship a few different stage ones. Um, the first one, as I mentioned, by default, we use the sort of classic Linux containers, which is C groups and Linux namespaces. Um, and to do that, we leverage systemd and spawn. And then the second major um, stage one that we have available uh, uses LKVM, which is a, a user space um, uh, tool that can uh, fire up uh, vir virtual machines very, very quickly on Linux. And so that, that fires up an entire VM using KVM technology uh, to contain that pod. Um, and then we have uh, another, another one we call sort of Rocket Fly, which just basically does a simple cheroot to execute your application. And the idea there is that sometimes you, you might just want to use um, Rocket or something like it as almost like a package manager. So 
to get all the benefits of container image management. So you can discover them over the internet, download them, unpack them, verify them, check their signatures and things like that. But actually you just want to run a process and you just want to, um, and that's really handy on, on distributions like CoreOS where you, know, you don't have a classic package manager. And then finally we have some patches up at the moment uh, to integrate a QMU based uh, stage one. Which, may, which obviously leverages the QMU um, hypervisor to, 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 spin up, um, to spin up a VM to run that pod. So again, kind of stepping back to what that looks like in terms of the different stages. In this case, with the default uh, stage one I mentioned there that runs the pod, um, it's just based on systemd nspawn. Um, but you know, with, if you uh, change, change rocket to c configuration to point to the LKVM stage one instead, um, then you know, all the other things look the same. All the operations that you run on the command line look the same. Um, to the application, it looks, should look, the environment should look exactly the same, but um, you know, the actual technology that's being used to run the pod has changed, and now you get you know, the, the advantages that these different, um, different stage ones can provide. So that was a bit about composability. Um, the final aspect of, about Rocket uh, I want to talk about is, is sort of standards and, and compatibility. So there's a few different ways that, that Rocket approaches um, standards and compatibility. Um, as I said, when Rocket first came out, it was really intended to drive a conversation around standardizing some things in the industry because uh, the, you know, containers were being adopted and being widely used, but it was really just a sort of de facto standard. Nothing was really written down about like, what a container is, you know, what a container image format is, uh, what it means for an application to run a container, what C groups it can expect, all these different things. Uh, we wanted that to be well, to written down and well-defined so that people could build tools against it and you know, expect and know that they would work. They're not necessarily beholden to a particular technology, a particular tool. So with that in mind, we developed AppC, which was our first attempt at a, at a, at a specification for containers, um, and that's what Rocket implements, and that's what Rocket uses sort of as its native format today. The other main aspect around sort of standards with Rocket was the, is networking. Um, as I mentioned, we have uh, networking plugins for Rocket, and that's a, that's a system that we call um, CNI. Uh, and that's like common, just common network pl plumbing that um, different projects use. Uh, I'll touch on some more in a second. Um, which means that you, know, you can develop these plugins for different systems, anything that supports CNI, and you can use them natively in Rocket. Um, and then as far as compatibility goes, you know, we want to support different image formats that are out there. So you know, as a first example, Rocket can run uh, Docker images natively, which is nice for sort of um, back compatibility, particularly when integrating with Kubernetes. And then just looking at some more sort of recent developments, um, you know, the Rocket developers participate very actively in, in this different standard efforts that are going on at the moment. So AppC, OCI, CNCF, which I'll touch on in a second, um, and I really wanted to highlight that, you know, we are, we're not, uh, we're definitely committed to supporting these, any standards that emerge in the industry. We don't have a particular, agenda, a particular thing that we're trying to focus on. So just to touch on sort of the bit of the history of standards, because you might have heard of a few different things going on in the last couple of years. Um, as I said, AppC was announced at the same time as Rocket, and that was our attempt to, to sort of uh, define in sort of an, an open way what a container is. Um, AppC saw quite a bit of adoption by some different groups, but you know, notably there was no participation from the sort of dominant container vendor, which is, was Docker at the time. Um, but in, in June of 2015, uh, we joined together with Docker to form this, this group called the Open Container Initiative, which at the time we, we had hoped would be um, the sort of room for this, this discussion to move and to play out, and to define the image format that we could all agree on uh, and all support. Um, and then a few months later, um, we had this other body emerge called CNCF, um, which is the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, which is also um, has sort of a charter to develop um, and harmonize different sort of technologies in the container and microservices space. So you might have heard recently that Kubernetes, for example, um, has been donated uh, to the CNCF, and we've also been in discussions about um, CNI moving into the CNCF. Um, but just to try and tie together some of these things, in particular sort of AppC and OCI, because you might be wondering, like, why are there still these two kind of things? Well. Uh, when OCI stand, uh, started, um, we had joined with the uh, expectation and hope that uh, an image format would come from this that we could all use. Um, but unfortunately, there was sort of quite a bit of pushback for quite a while, um, and it became apparent that uh, the founders weren't necessarily interested in, in standardizing the same thing. Um, I'm happy to say that recently that's changed. Um, I think Brandon sort of touched on this in his keynote this morning, so now there's a new um, image format group within the body of the OCI. And our, idea, the, our, our hope is that you know, all of the stuff that we tried to, to start a conversation around with AppC, um, all, of that, all of those key features really end up in OCI. So just to give you kind of a quick overview here, 
um, things like content addressability and signability and, and, and uh, DNS namespace to be able to discover containers. Um, these are things we, pioneer, we, well, we tried to bring up in, in, in AppSea. Um, we saw adoption to varying degrees in the next generation uh, Docker image format. Um, and then in OCI, uh, we're planning to work from the Docker image format, um, polish up a few areas, and bring you know, anything that we think is missing from AppSea, um, and finalize this new format that's supported by all the major container runtimes. If you're interested in standards at all, um, I'd recommend seeing this talk later today by Vincent Batts. Um, ask him all your gnarly questions about container standards. He's been working on this stuff for a long time, and he's also a maintainer on uh, both AppSe um, and the different OCI uh, standards groups. And then the other thing I wanted to talk about a little bit is CNI. So CNI is a very, very simple um, standard, or specification, I should say, not uh, around you know how you can configure networks and provide them to containers. Um, so it's basically just a, a simple configuration format and a command line interface to say like, hey, I want to join this container or this Linux name, network namespace um, to this network. And then all of the you know, implementation details are in the plugins themselves. Um, CNI is being quite widely adopted outside of Rocket. So it started as just used by Rocket, but it's since been adopted by Kerma, which is another container runtime. Um, Kubernetes itself, it's going to become the new standard um, network configuration mechanism for Kubernetes. Um, and then we've seen groups like Cloud Foundry, Weave, and Calico, uh, who are all uh, active maintainers on CNI as well, um, produce integrations for these things, as well as uh, Contiv networking too. But I'm here today more so to talk about Kubernetes itself, so uh, let's get on with that. So as I'm sure most of you know, Kubernetes is about um, cluster level container orchestration. And it handles you know, all these nice things for you, like it provides a sort of service abstraction for your applications. It handles scheduling them in the cluster. It allows you to upgrade your applications um, on the fly. It allows you to recover from machine failures. Um, and it allows you to you know, scale your applications horizontally in a cluster. So Kubernetes is sort of, you know, it is a container orchestrator. But today, what that really means um, in practice is it's a Docker container orchestrator. But there's no real reason for this to strictly be the case because you know, the Kubernetes API, which is what users interact with, um, it doesn't really talk about the container abstraction so much as it talks about the pod abstraction, which is, you know, if anyone's not familiar with a pod, that's just a grouping of, of one or more containers. Um, the only area in the Kubernetes API which is at the moment kind of tied to the container um, is the image format area, which I'll, at the moment expects Docker images. But other than that, you know, the main primitive that users should be thinking about when they're working with Kubernetes is the pod. So the idea of you know, Rocket Netties is combining the power of Kubernetes with the power of Rocket um, and using Rocket as the container runtime and getting, taking some of the advantages that Rocket, we think Rocket provides. Um, this isn't an official logo. It's just something someone in my team whipped up. But hopefully, it'll, hopefully something will come of it. So. Just to look at what that looks like a bit. Um, so the kubelet, for those of you who aren't familiar, is a, is a daemon that runs on every Kubernetes worker in a cluster. And that's what's responsible for actually running your, you know, your pods. So Kubernetes schedules pods. And then a kubelet you know, sees that those pods have been scheduled. And then it actually does the, uh, does the work to run the pod. But it, it actually delegates most of the work to the container runtime, which um, in the default, default implementation today is Docker. And the container runtime is what's responsible for doing the things that you expect from a container runtime, like fetch images, um, start containers, stock containers, all these things. So the way that's implemented is that uh, Kuber the kubelet code, um, so in the Kubernetes repository, uh, it has a, an interface, a Go interface, <coughs> called the container runtime interface. And at the moment, that, that exposes these quite high level um, uh, methods, like sync pod, or get pod, or kill pod, that um, you know, implementers can, in theory, implement. And so you know, within that logic, you would see it you know, starting up the necessary containers, stopping the necessary containers, all these sorts of things. And you know, they started, when Kubernetes first came out, it started with this sort of basic interface, which in theory, anyone could imp implement by just implementing this interface with your own container runtime, make sure you, you, know, you make these methods work, and then you can voila, you can have another runtime. But in practice, there's a lot of assumptions, a lot of fine details about, uh, that assume Docker. Um, and a lot of you know, refactoring work that we had to go through to, to work on supporting another runtime. So you know, before, Kubernetes, uh, before Rocket Netties, um, basically there was that one implementation of the interface, and that talked to the Docker daemon to do everything. Um, in Rocket Netties, the situation is a little, a little different because the Rocket architecture is quite different. As I mentioned, we don't have that sort of central daemon that can control all the containers on the system. Instead, we, expose, we, we interact with a Kubernetes, the Kubernetes in a couple of different ways. 
So, you know, the Kubelet actually directly executes Rocket to, for some preparation tasks, so to pull down container images and to set up a pod uh, on the file system. And then um, the Kubelet talks to systemd to start, uh, to actually run Rocket, to run pods, and I'll, I'll touch on why in a second. And then the other, the final side of it is that Kubernetes can, uh, the Kubelet talks to the Rocket API service that we expose um, to gather information about Rocket pods that are running on the system. So let's try and explore what that looks like. Um, as I said, in the default Kubernetes mode, um, we have sort of the Kubelet sitting here on a system, um, and that's talking to Docker, the Docker daemon over at the, the Docker daemon API. And it's telling the Docker daemon, you know, start this container, stop that container. And the Docker daemon is directly parenting and managing the life cycle of those individual containers. Well, what's wrong with this? Why won't we want to, 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 to change this? There's a few things with this, with this particular model. Um, the first is that, you know, since Docker doesn't understand the concept of pods, since it just understands individual containers, then the Kubelet needs to ma manage all of this um, mapping, this sort of information that maps, you know, what a pod is to what individual containers are. So it needs to maintain a map, you know, in, its own, in memory or and potentially persisted of, um, you know, which containers that it's talking to, to Docker about uh, belong to which pod and all that stuff. And then the more, one of the more, well, what we think is a more troubling aspect is that the, to sort of give the illusion to create a pod, um, the Kubelet needs to manage this special uh, infra, what they call an infra container or a sleep container to hold the namespaces for that pod. Because since a pod is defined as different containers that share different names, uh, certain namespaces, like for example, um, uh, the network namespace, uh, the, the Kubelet needs to tell Docker, uh, okay, create this container and then attach it to this other container that's just existing, just running a permanent sleep, um, just to maintain uh, those namespaces. The other problem with this particular architecture is that the Docker daemon is a single point of failure for the node, so if the daemon dies, then the containers die. Um, that's not gonna be a problem in the future, and I'll touch on why. Um, but then the final issue for us is that, you know, Docker doesn't integrate particularly well with systemd, um, for example, in terms of secret, secret management. This has caused a lot of issues over the last year, and, and particularly when integrating with Kubernetes in a different way. Um, this is really important to us because at Chorus we, we are big believers in systemd um, and it's now been adopted by you know, all the major Linux distributions and so we think that you know, for better or worse systemd is kind of here to stay um, for most practical purposes and we think it's important to, to work with it wherever possible. Otherwise, if you're gonna be fighting against it, there's always gonna be all kinds of problems with uh, process management and secret management and things like that. So I mentioned that this is the case today but um, it's gonna, actually gonna change a little bit with, with future Docker releases. So, Currently, um, uh, the last version of Docker that Kubernetes has validated against is, I believe, 109 or 110. Um, they're exploring uh, validating against 1.11, um, but that has quite a big architectural change within Docker itself, which you probably, you might have seen with the 1.11 announcement, is that Docker has now split out a separate daemon called ContainerD, and now ContainerD is responsible for doing the actual uh, 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 container start operations. Um, we think this is, Maybe a little, you know, the nice thing about this is now the Docker daemon is no longer a single point of failure. If the Docker daemon dies, then your containers don't go down with it. Um, as of today, container D is instead a single point of failure, um, but that's not always gonna be the case. Um, they're working on, you know, implementing persistence so that uh, container D can also die without affecting containers. But to do that, they introduced this, this shim component, which you can see here, the container D shim, which needs to hang around so that when container D restarts, it has something to reconnect to which introduces a little bit of overhead um, for, each, uh, for each container, um, which you know, is not ideal. Um, we have similar kind of thing in Rocket uh, where we have you know, a long-lived sort of process that manages the, 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 the life cycle of the container, but in the Rocket case, it manages the life cycle of the entire pod rather than per container. So you know, if you have a pod with potentially many containers, then in the container D case, you have a shim for every single container as a long-lived process, whereas in Rocket, you just have a single instance. And we also think there's kind of a lot of moving parts here, like arguably you're now introducing another component that can potentially fail, another, you know, another integration point. Um, it would be nicer if we could just, in some ways the previous model was nicer because it was a much simpler API contract between you know, the Kubelet and, and, and the Docker daemon itself. But this is, this is sort of the future of Docker, um, and to their credit, you know, they are, um, they're finally you know, gonna, gonna achieve this kind of long-standing goal of, of being able to upgrade the daemon without restarting containers. Um, but you know, still, uh, that's the situation today, and that's kind of um, part of the reason that's guiding us to work on something like Rocket Netties. And we think it provides, or, you know, all those issues that we think are kind of drawbacks with the current model. We think are basically solved uh, using Rocket Netties. So as I said, um, Rocket is, is pod native, so now we can have that, you know, 
the Kubla can sort of talk at the pod level to the runtime. Um, there's first class integration with systemd, so no real kind of conflicts over who's managing what. Um, and since pods are self-contained processes, there's no single point of failure for, for all the pods or all the containers. Um, and then, you know, we get the other, the advantages of like different compatibility. So if Rocket supports multiple image formats, like the Docker image format or the OCI image format, you know, you get all that now in Kubernetes. And then the final goal is that, um, you know, since it's transparently swappable, both within Rocketnetes and within, um, sorry, within Kubernetes and then also within sort of the stage one in Rocket itself, um, we can, you know, swap out these different technologies without impacting users at all. So as I said, before Rocketnetes, you know, the, the Kubelet um, talked to the Docker daemon for all of its tasks. Um, but now the Kubernetes, uh, the Kubelet talks to a few different things to, to orchestrate um, uh, rock, running Rocket containers, Rocket pods. So this is sort of how things look today. And I'll talk through this. Um, as I mentioned, um, the Kubelet, you know, executes Rocket directly just to perform some basic preparatory, preparatory tasks. So just pulling down images and setting up file systems. Um, it then talks to system D to actually start rocket pods. So it basically submits a unit file to system D that says, hey, start this rocket command um, that you know, is running this pod. Um, and the reason it does that is then system D as the init system is responsible for managing that pod lifecycle. So, and, 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 and so that if the kubelet dies, for example, um, the pod will happily keep on running. If any of the individual rocket, rocket pods die, uh, the, pod will, the other pods will happily keep on running. We also expose an API service to, um, to expose information about rocket pods. And the idea here is that um, the uh, API service provides sort of a read-only view of, it understands the on-disk format of rocket. Um, it can provide a read-only view of what pods are running, what images are available, and all these sorts of things in a very efficient way. So rather than the kubelet having to fork out and call rocket, the rocket command line to get this information, it can talk to this gRPC service, which is running, um, running as an unprivileged user. Um, and can introspect this information about what's running on the system. And that means we don't have to try and store that state you know, in system D or something like that. But as I said, the really nice thing here is that if any of these components, if the kubelet fails or if the rocket API service fails, it doesn't impact the running pods at all. Um, you can recover from that situation. It, the only um, central point of failure in this system is uh, system D, but if system D fails in your system, then your system's completely hosed anyway. So we think that's a pretty reasonable uh, trade-off. Um, so just again, sort of touching on some of the benefits of this. Um, since there's no daemon, we, we already get that nice ability to be able to upgrade the container runtime, so to upgrade Rocket without affecting any of the existing pods. Since we have that um, internal uh, swappability, we can uh, provide different stage ones to get you know, more advanced isolation technologies or like LKVM without needing to modify Kubernetes at all. And since we integrate well with systemd, then we can, uh, system administrators can use all the sort of native tooling, systemd tooling, like machine CTL, system CTL, journal CTL, to actually look at um, pods and apps on the system. Um, I'll give a quick demo of that in a minute. Um, so another alternative, um, which is sort of being considered, is to, uh, you know, that since the rocket process model can, you know, is very simple, Kubelet, if it wanted, could take over complete ownership of pods. So rather than, than, forking out, uh, than sending a pod to system D to be run, the Kubelet could actually just start up the rocket processes directly and manage their life cycle that way. Unfortunately, in this case, then you're back to the Kubelet kind of being a single point of failure, but it would mean a little more fine-grained control over um, what the Kubelet can do with pods uh, rather than it needing to talk to, to system D. So that's a bit about Rocket Eddies. Um, when, when can you use it or where can you use it? Well, we're aiming for an official release in Kubernetes 1.3, which is the next main release of, uh, next major release of Kubernetes. Um, our sort of criterion for uh, success is that we pass all the end-to-end -end tests. As you may know, Kubernetes has a, quite an exhaustive set of end-to-end -end tests. Um, and so we're, we're pretty close. We're above 90%, and we just have a few more things to iron out. And if you want to get started today, um, there's a getting started guide in the official Kubernetes docs. Um, and we also have, since everyone needs a .io, of course, we have rocketnetis.io, which currently just uh, points to the documentation, um, and we'll sort of update that with, with more information as we have it. Um, just to talk a little bit about what's coming in the future. Uh, after 1.3, after we have Rocketnetis fully integrated, Kubernetes team actually wants to rework that interface that we talked about. So moving away from this declarative model with these big functions of, of you know, sync pod, where, a container run, where you need to have this um, big implementation potentially about what it means to sync a pod. They want to move to more granular and imperative operations like create pod and create container in pod uh, rather than like sync entire pod. 
And part of the motivation there, for example, is uh, they want to be able to uh, dynamically mutate pods, so adding a new container to a pod, or um, dynamically changing resource limits on a pod, for example. So for things like auto-scaling um, or over-provisioning. So being able to update uh, resource constraints on the fly for at the pod level and also at the individual container level. But you might be asking, well, if they're moving to container level operations, then why do we even have this pod abstract production? And what's the benefit of, of, of you know, Rocket providing this pod thing? Well, as I mentioned, even though they want to move to more, a more granular control, on the one hand, there's still a lot of benefit from the pod model, since there are still things like resource controls that are going to need to be applied at the pod level. Um, and the other really nice thing about you know, this route that we've gone with Rocket is that by leveraging systemd very heavily, by leveraging it internally as well, we can actually get a lot of these granular operations for free using like native systemd um, APIs and systemd controls. So, for example, um, you can use journal CTL um, to act on, on a Rocket pod and extract the logs from a particular container in a pod. Or in future, this isn't quite implemented, but we're working on it right now, you'll be able to use system CTL to talk to a Rocket pod and tell it, hey, start this new application in the pod. So. Um, that's sort of the future of, of how Rocket's going to integrate with, with um, Kubernetes, is that you know, Kubernetes will uh, be able to uh, basically leverage these, uh, both the, pod, the whole pod model and then also perform uh, per container operations by uh, basically using the systemd API. And then the other big thing that's coming is, is um, OCI. As I mentioned, this is a, the new image format that we're sort of actively working on to integrate all the, sort of, all the best learnings from AppSe and from the Docker image format. Um, and, more importantly, it's an image format that everyone's you know, hopefully going to support. Um, so at the moment, we're pretty actively developing the spec itself for the image format, and then um, some of the tooling around it, so being able to uh, validate and build images. And then as soon as we have a, a sort of a 1.0 of that format, which we're really pushing for aggressively in the next couple of months, uh, we want to push this format into the API, since at the moment, the only image format the API supports is the Docker image format, which is fine for Rocket since uh, you know, Rocket supports that, but ultimately, we want that to be a shared image format. And I want to give a quick demo. How, do we, how much time do we have? About eight minutes. So I want to demo a little bit of the stuff that I've been talking about. So here, whoops. Here we have this. Um, I just have a small Kubernetes cluster running on my laptop using, using libvert, running the, you know, the, the guestbook example, which hopefully most of you are sort of familiar with. And just to give you an example of what it looks like on one of the nodes, prove that I'm not cheating. Docker is there, but nothing's actually running. Um, whereas, you know, all of our, our pods are happily running. So what that looks like from the Rocket perspective is that we can see, uh, ro oops, sorry about that. How about the app? Oops. Um, we have uh, three pods running here. So we have we have Slave here, we have um, this one with, with etcd, and then we have uh, all the different components, the, the, the Kubernetes, Kube to Sky components. And the interesting thing here is that, you know, we see these different apps running within a single pod. So to look at what that looks like at sort of the process level, um, we could, uh, if we have a look here, um, you can see this is sort of the rocket. That I mentioned we sort of have that stage one process that manages the life cycle of the whole pod. And then within that process, we actually start up a system D. Um, and system D is responsible for managing the individual apps. So in this case, for that pod that we looked at there with, uh, that's running Coop to Sky, Sky DNS, Health Z, we can actually see those processes running uh, individually within that, within that pod. Um, I mentioned we integrate with, uh, since this is running on CoreOS, which is a system D system, we integrate with um, things like machine CTL, system machine D. So each rocket pod gets registered with machine D. Um, and then we can use that to, um, you know, look at information on, information on that pod. And we can actually see the whole sort of tree here of the different uh, apps running within the pod. Um, and then that, that also extends to kind of using journal. So if we were to use journal CTL, oops. So this is using, this is, I'm on the actual host here, but I'm using journal CTL to look at the logs, you know, within the rocket pod. Um, and I can see everything running within my pod there. SkyDNS doesn't look too happy. And then I can even drill down using the sort of standard, um, you know, journal filtering operations of saying, oh, I just want to look at this particular app, this particular unit. And now I'm looking at just the, just the, um, just the logs for etcd within the pod. So the nice part about here is that, you know, we don't have to implement or maintain any of this stuff. Um, we, we, since we integrate with systemd and with journal D, all of this, all of this is provided uh, for us. So then, you know, all, anything that uh, journal CTL can support, like, uh, let's see, 
output equals JSON. Now we have, you know, logs from a, a, an application level uh, running within a pod, you know, in a JSON format. All the stuff that's supported by these commands um, works sort of natively with, uh, with Rocket Pods. Um, yeah, so if we've got a few minutes left, I might uh, take some questions, but, oh, at first, if you want to get involved, um, I'd encourage you to join us on GitHub. We're all pretty active there and responsive to issues or on Freenode. And if you're interested in the, in the sort of container runtime work within Kubernetes itself, I'd encourage you to check out the Kubernetes node special interest group. That's where all this discussion happens and where we're defining the next generation of the, the runtime interface. Um, we'll be having office hours today for Rocket um, at 2.30 at the CoreOS booth. And if you're interested in working on Rocket, um, I'm hiring here in, in Berlin to work on Rocket, so you could uh, join us here. And yeah, we'll leave a few minutes for any questions. No questions. <laughs> Thanks. Anyone? Yes. So do you expect people to run uh, a Rocket or uh, Docker in their Kubernetes uh, cluster or using both to select that, uh, the pod level, pod level which uh, engine they want? So at the, at the moment it's configurable at the node level and we don't expect people to run multiple runtimes at the node level. Um, so if you fire up a Kubernetes node, you, know, you configure it at, to, to, to use either, Kubernetes, uh, sorry, either Docker or Rocket or in future Hyper or something like that. Um, but within a cluster itself, you can definitely potentially have different runtimes. But there's, since there's quite a tight integration between the runtime and um, uh, the, the kubelet, at the moment it's expected, since the kubelet wants to sort of manage the entire node, um, yeah, at the moment it just supports one runtime. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned that you are going to support Quemu actually. Uh, what is pushing that? You know, L LKVM is a, if you take memory foot footprint wise, it is very small. Why you want to use Quemu actually? Um, that's a good question. I haven't actually looked into that a lot. It's something that uh, we just had a, so we have some developers, there are some developers working at Intel on um, some of this virtualization support. And they've actually, we hadn't even talked to them about it. They've actually just put up a big patch to add QMU support. Um, I think they think it's going to resolve some of the issues, make some things easier to manage than the KVM uh, uh, solution, but I don't actually know the advantages of it today, since, as you mentioned, LKVM is, you know, theoretically more sort of, uh, much more efficient solution, but. One more yeah. question. All right. Thanks, everyone.